from the RSNA, this is the Radiology Artificial Intelligence Podcast. My name is Paul Gee, and I'm a radiologist at the University of Maryland and co-host of the podcast. And my name is Ali Tijani, and I'm a radiology resident at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center and co-host of the podcast. Each month, we dive into the hottest topics in radiology AI and talk with leading experts, thought leaders, and movers and shakers in the field. All right, everyone, welcome to the second annual Radiology Artificial Intelligence Fireside Chat. This is coming to you live from the RSNA 2022 annual meeting. This is the official Radiology AI Journal podcast, and we'll be doing a really exciting live podcast recording today. The topic of today's talk is how will AI improve and change the practice of radiology over the next five years? If you can tell, there's a lot of excitement over AI. There seems to be a new startup coming up every week. And certainly here at the RSNA, we're here in full force. So as we think about how AI is integrated clinically, we have to consider a lot of different issues, ranging from how do we develop it, how do we make sure that these algorithms are ready for prime time, and then how do we integrate these things. So tonight, we'll be having a fireside chat with some of the leaders in the field, talking about these topics and more. So with that, I'll give it over to my co-host, Ali Tejani. Uh, my name is Paul Yi. I'm a radiologist at the University of Maryland, and uh, I'll give it over to Ali. Thanks, Paul. It's great to be here. And thank you to all of our guests for being here. We'll get started just momentarily, but before we get to the main events, just a quick reminder that this is going to be an interactive session. So we're hoping that you have questions and maybe questions bubble up throughout the conversation. At that point, we'll have a dedicated time at the end once our conversation is over to actually speak with you and to see what your thoughts are. So what we'll do is raise your hand and hold at the end of the session. I'll come over with a mic and we'll get started. So again, if you please hold your questions till the end of the session, we'd really appreciate that. So now let's go ahead and get started with our introductions. For all of our guests here, thank you again for being here. If, you could, if we could start with Elliot and move down the row. If you could tell me, it's a lot of information, okay? If you could tell me your name. Elliot. Okay, <laughs> well, 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 almost there, okay. Oh, that's good, that's good. So your name, your role at your institution, and one fa fun fact that pertains to AI. Elliot, what, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, institution is uh, University of Maryland and the uh, VA Maryland uh, healthcare system. And as far as one fact that pertains to AI is, I had the opportunity to create the world's first filmless radiology department. And uh, we'll be um, essentially uh, celebrating uh, this year the uh, 30th anniversary um, coming up this summer of, uh, of um, the transition to um, digital operation, and I never would have guessed that in 30 years after we made that transition, where we partly wanted to do it, to take advantage of AI types of applications, 30 years later, the majority of us would not have AI for the most part in our institutions. Brad Erickson, I'm a neuroradiologist at Mayo Clinic, and I direct the Mayo AI Lab. And, uh, you know, I think, um, I'm not sure if it's a fun fact, but, you know, I think the, the, the thing that sometimes is not appreciated about AI is uh, we're, we're all hearing now about AI, how AI can be fooled. And I think that sometimes when something happens that you don't expect is where the great discoveries in science are. And I think that that's kind of the opportunity that we need to figure out in AI is why did that AI fail when it should have worked, right? That, that's the great opportunity. That's fun, right? I'm Kirthi Magudia. I'm an assistant professor at Duke in abdominal imaging. I'm just starting out my career, so two years out from fellowship. And my fun fact for AI, I'm kind of heading towards more of the AI research kind of side of things and trying to see what we can do with AI and medical imaging. I serendipitously entered that um, when I was a resident. And I am very excited about AI because I think it's the true um, it's truly where we can do translational research in radiology in a way that's really going to transform the way that we practice. And I think that is really what gets me excited. And uh, I'm Chuck Kahn. I'm a, an abdominal imager and vice chair at the University of Pennsylvania in, in Philly. Uh, I also serve as editor of, uh, radio of uh, RSNA's uh, journal, Radiology Artificial Intelligence. And I guess my fun fact is uh, one of the very first projects that I did as a resident, uh, in fact, was a, an AI system. But this is not deep learning. This was not artificial neural networks. This was a rule-based system uh, to help guide 
uh, referring physicians to uh, appropriate uh, radiology procedures. All right, and we will have one more distinguished guest joining us in about 10 or 15 minutes, Dr. Linda Moy, who is a professor of radiology at NYU Langone Medical Center, as well as the incoming editor-in-chief of radiology. So to get things started, um, can we cue the slides? All right, so we'll get things started with a, uh, well, just a little bit of a teaser here. So a lot of you might be aware of this paper uh, published in radiology just a few months ago. This was machine learning for adrenal gland segmentation and classification of normal and adrenal masses at CT. Now this may seem a little humdrum to those of you who may not have been following uh, AI leaders like Dr. Siegel over the past few years, but this created a lot of buzz because, well, I'll let uh, Dr. Matt Lundgren do the talking. And such a big challenge that for many years, our own uh, very, very famous Dr. Siegel uh, has uh, claimed that if anyone can accomplish this, yeah, he'd be happy to wash, wash their car, which was something that I was, uh, I was surprised uh, to hear. I mean, clearly it's a difficult challenge uh, and Dr. Siegel uh, may have some talents that we're not aware of, but, but obviously my colleague, Kurt Langlotz uh, pointed this out recently on Twitter. And, um, and then I reached out to uh, the co-authors of this paper and in, in the process, I said, you know, did, is there any, you know, actual evidence documenting this, this challenge, this gauntlet that's been thrown down uh, to the community? And indeed there are. In fact, uh, Dr. Siegel has been on many different keynote presentations <laughs> describing this, uh, this sort of benchmark that if we can achieve it as a community, uh, he'd be happy to step up and, and wash some cars. And in case you can't tell if that's Dr. Siegel, um, I'll just, there you go. There, now, now you can see. It was definitely him. Uh, there's the YouTube link if you want to, if you want to. So, um, you know, Elliot, Elliot knows about this, but the MGH group actually uh, kind of shot back with some photos. This is the senior author, Dr. Bill Mayo Smith, saying my Subaru is really dirty and can use a wash. And uh, the rest of the team, including uh, Dr. Keith Schreier from MGH uh, with a golf cart. So I guess, uh, Elliot, the question is, uh, is it time for you to wash some cars? Yeah, so um, thanks for the introduction. And I, I was talking with uh, um, Brad this morning, and one of the things I'd like to point out is that this type of fun interaction and, and kind of throwing a little uh, a shade is really so characteristic of the imaging informatics community. And, and so it, it's just, I mean, it, it's a hilarious way to really be able to, to make a point. And I don't think any other subspecialty in radiology would have a bunch of people uh, standing in front of their car with dryer in front of his uh, golf cart uh, talking about washing the car. So first of all, I'd, I'd love to compliment, you know, my colleagues and, and friends in uh, imaging informatics. But I, what I'd like to do is first of all, rebut the, uh, the premise that I'd need to wash anybody's car. I'm gonna bring out my fifth grader. And so uh, let, let's have him do a little uh, talking. Uh, just so you know, this guy is Dr. Khan Siddiqui. This is his son, Ferris. We have obtained all necessary permissions. In fifth grade. In fifth grade. He's not that small anymore. Hi, I'm Ferris Siddiqui, and I'm in fifth grade. And I'm going to find the adrenal gland on a CT scan. I have not seen these cases before. So on here... This is the left adrenal gland, and this is the right adrenal gland. Yeah, so first of all, yay humans. And, and, uh, and the other thing I'd like to say is I'm super impressed with my colleagues at Mass General being able to even find the adrenal. The reason I issued that challenge overall was in response to the question of whether or not radiologists will be replaced. And one of the things I wanted to point out, number one, was it's really hard to even find some anatom anatomic structures such as the adrenals. But number two is that was really a shout out to humans. I mean, uh, Faris, uh, the fifth grader, spent about 15 minutes or so literally learning what an adrenal gland was, where it was, and was able to uh, um, find and identify it. And what I'd like to do is issue the challenge to the authors at MassGen before I'd pull out my, uh, my um, car washing uh, material and at the next SIM meeting or the next RSNA, I want cases that have not been seen before and I wanna bring my fifth grader and I wanna essentially have the algorithm head to head with cases it hasn't seen 
with a CT scan with the uh, fifth grader. So I want to throw the gauntlet back down on the authors. My prediction is that they will not want to um, essentially do a free range set with no cases that they have seen uh, previously but I would love to uh, essentially follow that up. But really, I, I think the instructive point here is that humans learn really, really quickly. And uh, it's really tough to be humans, whether you're a fifth grader or whether you're a radiologist, and that we're heading in the direction with AI of algorithms that are much better able to learn with much smaller data sets. And I think that that's something that's really exciting and there's a lot of cool computer science developments in that area. So I'm not ready to pull out my chamois cloth and. Uh, and wash cars yet, but I want to throw back that uh, that gauntlet. And the AI Center at the University of Maryland is going to back me up on uh, that. So you'll, hopefully, you'll be hearing more soon. All right. So you've heard it first. There's a new gauntlet that's been thrown down. Um, this isn't open just to the MGH group, but anyone who wants to try their algorithm, uh, just reach out to us. Um, so with that, we've heard Dr. Siegel's take on this. But I want to hear from the rest of our panelists. Where are we today with AI in 2022? Are we at a place where AI can, in fact, do better than a fifth grader, or hopefully a little bit better than that, or are we still uh, ways to go? So Elliot gave me the, the mic, so I guess I get to respond to my buddy. Um, you, you know, I think, so, so let's think about the challenge that Elliot just laid out, okay? What is the metric? Is it touching the adrenal? Is it drawing a box around the adrenal? Is it drawing the contours of the adrenal? So when you think about designing your AI task, you have to be very careful in figuring out what it is that you want to achieve. And then there's also the challenge of, okay, RS can do one, two, three, but by the way, for a protocol, I need to have 350,000 done, right? The, the nice thing about AI is that it never gets tired. And so as we think about, you know, the, this whole thing about AI replacing radiologists, let's focus on AI replacing the TDS humdrum, boring stuff that needs to be done very well. And I think that that's where AI really has the great opportunity. And so, I mean, I, I, I love doing these challenges, but you know, we, we need to be thoughtful about what are the things that we really should be replacing humans with and what things should we keep the human in the loop. I think we're starting to feel the heat now, by the way. So just a heads up that the bar has been raised. <laughs> Was, are you, go ahead. No. Um, well, I, there are a couple of things to that. You know, it, it's been said too that any physician that a computer can replace really should be replaced, right? I mean, if if computers can do something as well or better than you as as a human, then then probably so. But you know, what happens with the uh, adrenal that isn't so normal? What happens with the one that uh, has hemorrhage and is oval and has calcifications in it? And does the does the uh, does the algorithm pick that up? So what what happens with the one that uh, that has a, a metastatic lung cancer in it? Um, and is the system doing it? One one of the things that I think is really interesting and, and is kind of a, a challenge is as a radiologist when I learned about pneumothorax, I learned it the, from seeing about ten cases on that order. Right? You see a small one, a subtle one, a small one, a big one, attention pneumothorax a false positive, you know, a fake out case that's that's a skin fold that's not really a pneumothorax. And the difference is that we as as physicians, we have a mental model that that we can build that helps us understand and frames the learning that that we do. And that's very different from the way AI systems approach it. They just see a pattern and we don't even know in many cases what what that pattern is. And so just as we go forward with all of these systems, um, the thing that, you know, the, the, the value of, of the challenge that, uh, that Elliot threw down there is that we, you know, show us the proof. We, we need to see evidence of, of that this thing works and show it across a variety of cases so that we can actually believe it. And that's one of the really great challenges that we have right now, I think, in AI. And we have a new guest here, so thank you for joining us, Dr. Moy. If you could just introduce yourself and your role at your institution and a fun fact about AI. Sure. About yourself and AI, rather. Sure. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Linda Moy. I'm a breast imager at um, NYU, and I do a lot of breast. And I'll tell you, my original algorithm was developed with Facebook, part of 
translation of different languages and a computer scientist approached me and said, you know, it looks like there's lots of exceptions within medical healthcare, <laughs> sort of like languages. You know, do you think there's any role for AI in this? It's like back in 2014, I was like, well, I guess it's worth a stab. Like, you know, I had no idea what it was and here we are today. So thank you for joining us. Let's go into our next question here and kind of flip the script. So we're talking, you know, we've heard stories about AI potentially reducing the demand for radiologists, replacing radiologists, which may not necessarily be true, by the way. But what if we think about it in another perspective? Is there an increased demand for radiologists now that we have so much information derived from AI models? All these findings that were too subtle to catch before, or maybe that we just didn't notice. How do we, how do we go about navigating this new complex environment, making sense from everything that wasn't there before and trying to determine what's next? So Kirti, I don't, I, I'd like to give you a chance to Yeah, sure. So I'm definitely from the, you know, very recent school of thought in terms of thinking about AI as being very helpful in this arena of opportunistic imaging. So thinking about things like body composition, coronary calcium scoring, um, you know, detection of abdominal aortic aneurysms, kind of things that, you know, may be happening and maybe we can flag those and that could be helpful, you know, to not just the radiologists, but to the ordering providers and creating new imaging biomarkers. So I think that this area is an area of true growth. And I feel like in that way, I'm, I'm echoing what Brad said that, you know, I feel like this is a nice, we kind of like to think about these problems of trying to do something that the radiologist can't do, but doing something the radiologist is doing at a scale that is not feasible otherwise, I feel like that is truly would be very helpful for the field. Dr. Moore, do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. So I do have you know, a bunch of thoughts. Now, one is, like I said, I'm a breast imager, and we had early applications of computer-aided detection with the goal of really finding more breast cancers, and turned out that we didn't really find that much more, and our false positive rate went up quite a bit. So that was just a lesson in that, gosh, you have a great tool. You knew you had to implement it, but I'll take the other path forward, which is, um, I think they're going to be very careful, meaning CMS, about whether to pay us for using AI for breast imaging. So we need to do more than just find more cancers. And that's where all these other tools can come in. Now we know the normal pattern for a mammogram, you know, can be used to um, stratify women for their risk of developing future breast cancers. You know, we can take normal um, arterial calcifications, again, use it to predict um, the future risk of having, let's say, coronary, coronary artery disease. So I think it's all this added value that we can give a patient a much more holistic view. And I'm hoping that that will be sort of a more holistic picture we can get from a mammogram rather than cancer, no cancer, and that will get some more um, reimbursement for us. Anybody else, any thoughts? Just, uh, I agree with with Linda, and I think there's tremendous opportunity actually going forward, and and particularly for for radiologists to own the findings that that we generate. You know, very often uh, I, I'm a body imager, so you'll see the incidental pancreatic cystic lesion. Well, what do you do with that? Well, the urologist who ordered the CT scan doesn't know what what to do with that, and in a way, the, and the 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 primary care provider. Who might you know might be affiliated with taking care of the patient may or may not know what to do with it but they're really relying on on the expertise of the radiologist and we're moving towards a situation where we actually have a follow-up clinic where the radiologist we have you know a nurse practitioner working under the instruction of the radiologist but working from outside the radiology department is you know making sure that these patients get get the appropriate follow-up care and i think all of these things, you know, we have to be careful. And I, I, I love the idea of, of opportunistic screening, but in the same way that AI generated false positives in mammograms, we have to be careful in what AI tools do about finding a, abdominal aortic aneurysms, coronary artery calcifications, you know, when pulmonary, you know, little tiny subsegmental PEs that, that we don't need to, to treat, right? We don't need to be finding all of those. I, I think that if you look at the field of genomics, the ability to connect genomic data with disease was critical. We as radiologists should own the field of phenomics, right? We have the best information about what is exactly how the genome has been expressed as well as environment and other things, right? So 
we should think about how to connect to the epidemiologist, which is, you know, where genomics also connects, and figure out how to use all that information that we collect there, right? I mean, body composition, not just the amount of coronary calcification, but probably the distribution. Oh, and all the other calcium that's going on, uh, you know, osteoporosis. There is a gold mine of information there, and if you can connect it to the epidemiologists and you start to have longitudinal databases, we're going to own the population health management piece. So, you know, there is the potential for us to become really valuable in a whole nother field. So that's where I get excited about how we really could become the centers of how patients are cared for. Yeah, and, and um, a lot of this question about whether or not there's going to be a need for more radiologists or fewer radiologists reminds me of 30 years ago when we first went digital and filmless. One of the things a lot of my colleagues as radiologists said is that going digital was going to be the end of radiology and radiologists because the images could be anywhere in the hospital and anybody, the surgeons would read them, the ED docs would read them, and it would end, we wouldn't need radiologists anymore. The other school of thought was is that you could window and level forever and that a radiologist would have to spend an hour on a chest radiograph trying to figure out what was in the image. And so there was a lot of question about whether we needed fewer radiologists or not. And what ended up happening is the way we practice as radiologists changed. Modalities changed and became more complex because we could do digital imaging. And so radiology itself evolved as the technology changed from film to a digital environment. And I think the same thing's happening. And I think the theme of what you're hearing here so far is that radiologists' roles are going to change. The expectation of what we glean from a, di from a diagnostic image is going to be greater. We'll have more of an idea of being able to predict what should you do with this study? Is it really changing? Is the change real? What's the likelihood that this is malignant? What is the likelihood that you should follow up on this incidental finding? So the radiology resident of today is going to have a greater level of responsibility, but a greater ability to practice medicine and radiology than we do now with a lot of the tedious time that we find uh, that we're doing findings, that radiologist will be informed by a much larger ecosystem of information to guide treatment decisions and to guide follow-ups. Thank you, and I think we've started to talk about kind of the core of this discussion, which was how do we see AI improving radiology? Let's get a little granular for just a moment then. What about the next, not, not just the full five years, but what about the shorter term? Can we expect any changes in the next year, three years? Or is that still too short of a time frame to actually see any reasonable differences in how we practice from AI? Well, I'll say that at my institution where I'm practicing, we do have some AI tools in deployment. And I think it's amazing to me to see how quickly they've been adopted and you know trusted in some sense. So they're not necessarily a yes, no, without anyone double checking what's going on. But for example, we have a long nodule detection kind of a tool and the, you know a lot of the trainees will and the chest imagers will use that primarily rather than using for example MIPS which I feel like were the standard where I trained and so I think that's been great to kind of see on my side to kind of see new tools and how I'm going to adapt to them. I just want to comment that we are already seeing changes with AI you know in our hospital center in our ER you know we run about 10 different algorithms stroke alert algorithm you know CT you know, for positive findings, you know, misplaced tube and chest x-ray. For me, when in breast imaging, you know, there's a chronic shortage that we have already, you know, been able to stratify probably malignancy. And I don't think we're that far away from triaging normal mammograms, meaning if the AI system, you know, has a very low level of suspicion that those mammograms will not be read by a radiologist. So I'll tell you, as we're playing around with this, you know, in that category of very low malignancy, we're actually looking at those that have the highest level, let's say seven or eight percent, and we're double reading those, and we're actually, you know, being able to be a little bit more accurate. So I, I think we're going to become smarter. The other thing too is now, when we find something, you hit a button, and it automatically populates in your report. So certainly um, removes all of my right versus left confusion. I get at four p.m. You know, in the reading room, but I think there are lots of efficiencies along the way too that can be gained. Linda, when do you think in the United States that we will allow AI to read a subset of mammograms um, autonomously? So you're, you're aware of the literature that talks about whether it's 30% or 70% or whatever that number is, 
that one can achieve 99 percent, 99 plus percent yeah. um, level of, um, you know, um, ability to be able to determine um, a case that is negative is truly negative. Right. You know, and that's, so yeah. do you think, I mean, because there are technical issues, there are political issues, there are reimbursement issues, I'm not really guessing that we in the United States will be moving to autonomous reading any time in the next short number of years, right. but do you believe otherwise? You know, I'll tell you, you know, two data points. One is that um, pre-COVID, there was some sort of a federal panel looking at trying to see whether standalone um, could be performed for two indications. One is reading mammogram, then the other is CTA to rule out pulmonary embolus. And at that time, the consensus was it was too premature to move forward. So I would say it probably still no. You know, the other issue is there was just a survey that was published looking at a thousand Dutch women, asking them what they think of AI, and 78% were opposed to having their mammogram read by an AI system only. I think came into this discussion because there was no explainability, you know, about how they reached that decision. So I think there has to certainly be more clinical validation. You know, I think we need to really gain the trust of our referring physicians and patients before that moves forward. So a few big hurdles ahead of us. So I, I think there's an, another uh, angle on that in that it's not just the performance, oh, it's 90 whatever percent. But there are technologies where you can know for a specific inference that the AI is highly confident, that the image was very much like the training set, so the result is reliable, as opposed to this one, maybe the patient moved a little bit, or something that made it look different. And I think that that's a critical component that I'm not aware is in any FDA cleared product yet, but I think that, you know, just like how if every one of our radiology reports said, this is absolutely a glioblastoma, right? How many of your clinicians would trust all the reads you do, right? I mean, it's just not realistic to say we're always certain. And so having this kind of orthogonal vector of this is the certainty level associated with the prediction is critical. Um, the other change that I think probably can happen in the next five years or so is actually what Chuck mentioned about rule system. Um, in other industries, process automation is significantly improving quality and efficiency and you know it's not like healthcare has oodles of money to throw around and i think that that's something that probably will start to happen um, we have a lot of point solutions that will do parts of the workflow process but we need something that strings it all together just like when a car is manufactured and i think that that uh, technology is probably another piece of ai that doesn't get enough to enough attention I think another thing that we're going to see in the next two, three years or so is going to be more of a transition to platforms for consuming AI. As people are using more and more AI algorithms, they're finding that they, it doesn't scale to have a separate agreement and a separate system. And so we're starting to see sort of the platform war, and we're starting to see some of the platforms starting to emerge. And so I think in the next three to five years, you'll see more and more people consuming their AI algorithms, not directly from the AI vendor, but through a platform. I think the other thing that you're gonna see more of is more incorporation of clinical information into um, AI also. And so being able to know more information about the patient and potentially being able to personalize AI, personalize breast cancer risk, personalize um, lung cancer risk, I think we'll be seeing more of that cross correlation with the clinical information. And then more um, evaluation of a prior and a current study. Most AI just looks at one study at one time and being able to take into account trajectory of change. I think those will be advances in the next five years. So I just wanted to play off of the kind of the example of, of mammography. What if, you know, I think one of the things we have is an opportunity to get a little creative, kind of get imaginative about how we might use AI. So for example, in, in, in the realm of, of pathology and cytology, about 95% of pap smears are read by automated systems alone. And those that then kick up an alert, then the pathologist steps in and, and takes a look at it. So what if we did a kind of a mixed model? You know, recognize that there are, you know, there are recommendations of different well-intentioned and well-informed groups that say you should screen every two years or some that say you screen every one. What if we screened every two, every year but every other year was just with AI, 
And so, you know, the worst case is if AI missed something, then the human would pick it up ostensibly the, the following year. And that would allow us to continue screening, perhaps extend it to get more people and potentially reduce, reduce costs. But here, here's kind of the little flip side, and this comes back, I like the, you're talking about cars. So Mercedes-Benz in, in, um, in Europe, if you are using one of their cars and you have it in full auto mode, in other words, it's a self-driving car, they indemnify you completely as the driver. So my question to kind of do this is, you know, because the question is, how do we implement something like this? Do we need to, is that something that we would have to demand from an AI system that if we're going to use it, that basically the, the company that provides AI indemnifies the physician and the hospital that, that are using it? I'm, I'm just curious as to the panel's thoughts. Yeah, well, I think it also raises the question of what is the bar for AI? Should the bar for AI be at the general radiologist level for reading mammograms? Should it be at the expert level? Should it be at Linda's level, essentially, of, of reading studies? And what do we accept? Um, and so in your car example, just if you say that AI has to be better than the average driver, I can tell you, depending on where you are in the country, the average driver you know, may not be uh, you know, something that you want to emulate. And uh, so... I want to do Philadelphia, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. So I, I think it really depends, and I don't think we've decided at this point. Overall, right now, we're holding AI to a much higher bar than we hold human radiologists. And so, you know, I think we need to rethink where that bar is, and I think then that really would inform us to be able to answer that question that you posed. I was going to add that on Sunday night we were at a reception, and this, came, this topic came up, which is, um, first, you know, can we be held liable, you know, if we miss something from AI? So the discussion got as far as, well, right now, the standard of care, you know, you can be sued as of any doctor if you're not doing standard of care. So right now, AI is not standard of care, but what if five years from now, it becomes standard of care that we're gonna hit the button with every exam that we read? And let's just say I choose to ignore a prediction, but I was incorrect, and then that comes back as cancer. But then at that point, you know, I might actually have been um, functioning below standard of care because standard of care, it says that you always have to use the AI. And here, I purposely ignored that recommendation. So we went back and forth and we talked about, well, who was going to be sued? And most of us didn't think that a vendor, you know, would end up being liable. It probably would end up being the doctor again and possibly, you know, the hospital or the big um, enterprise that they're working with because that's where the money is, you know, but we had a very heated discussion without any clear answers. One medical legal related question is, do you save the CAD marking? So in the U.S., the, prior to what we're calling AI, approximately 90 percent of the practices in the U.S. deleted or vaporized the CAD markings. And, you know, I, I've been in discussions and debates about that. Lenny Berlin told me the reason to delete or debate them is for medical legal reasons, which kind of scares me a little bit, but it's an interesting observation. Do you think moving forward with AI, we should keep mammography markings or should we continue to delete them? And of course, that raises the larger question about AI markings and inferences in general. Are they just for the radiologist and then we delete them at that point or should they be persistent? You know, we ended up keeping them because it turns out that lawyers can buy the same AI systems and run the mammograms through them and those marks will appear. So the fact that I've deleted it, you know, it, it still is searchable information. So we've kept it, um, you know, I, so I don't know. So you're in the small minority as far as mammography, but this is something that's really hotly debated for AI markings and findings in general and it really hasn't been resolved at this point and of experts or pundits that i've talked to it looks like there's a lot of disagreement about that yeah so um we've been talking a lot about the future right what's going on in the next three to five years even beyond but we're starting to talk a little bit um about the here and now and so i want to pose this question to kirti and then hear from the other panelists kirti you're involved with the imaging ai in practice um, initiative so rather than looking ahead, what do we do now as radiologists here in 2022 and coming up into 2023? How do we engage with AI in such a way that one, it won't impede our ability to deliver high quality care, 
and two, position us to even improve rapidly over the next few years as AI gets translated. Yeah, thank you so much. So I would say that first of all, the Imaging AI and Practice Demonstration Project uh, promoted by RSNA and the Radiology Informatics Committee is just in that direction. So I invite everyone to please come and join us there. It will be um, available tomorrow as well. Um, and what we're doing there is we're you know, allowing AI vendors to participate and to be kind of grouped in teams in order to show how AI products can be integrated throughout the radiology workflow. And I think what's important about that is it goes much beyond image analysis. These are not just algorithms that are analyzing images and segmenting or classifying or looking for abnormalities, but you know, going from places like work list prioritization, which has been mentioned, um, you know, throughout the entire imaging workflow. And so, you know, also another place that it could be helpful would be, for example, exam prioritization in terms of scheduling or smart scheduling, lots of different places where we can kind of improve the workflow for radiologists and help help ourselves. Um, and an important piece that we want to talk about there are interoperability standards. These don't sound very you know, sexy to the radiologist or to talk about at RSNA, but I would say that these standards are, are important because as the radiologist, you're going around to all these booths, but you want to make sure that these tools are going to be able to talk to each other, you know, that the, your AI results are going to be able to come into your radiology report. They're not going to involve a lot of manual clicking on your part. And so these are important questions to learn about now so that as you approach these, these vendors, you can ask the right questions and maximize the benefit of these products. <laughs> well, one thing, one thing I'll add to that is, you know, I think the one of the beauties of these imaging AI and practice demos where you have groups of both clinicians and engineers and data scientists come together is you have this really unique environment to have collaboration to conversations about coming together to solve problems that we all face and really understanding the other side. So I think that's something that we could always use more of. So thank, thank you, Kirti. Rook, Ellie, it sounds like you have something you want to say, so I'm going to yield to you. Well, just to answer your question really Quickly, I think one of the interesting challenges we have is we have no idea whether AI works in actual clinical practice. If you talk with the vendors, and I have talked with lots of them here and asked them, now that your systems are deployed, what feedback are you getting back on accuracy? How are you tracking that? And nobody is really tracking that. No one has the answer to my knowledge at this point. And so figuring out mechanisms to be able to do that. I've been meeting with the FDA on a regular basis because they want to do something they call post-market surveillance, which is what they do for drugs now. After they clear them, they actually want to know whether there are adverse events associated with the drugs and issues and problems. We don't have that mechanism right now for the majority of our algorithms. And so one of the things I'd like to see us do right now is figure out mechanisms where we have the ability to um, create a dashboard or to create some mechanism to be able to know what is the success rate at our own institution, to give the vendor feedback on what is the success so that they can make modifications, and then maybe to be able to share that information more generally as would be appropriate. So let me ask you this, why don't we have dashboards? It seems like we're, we have these events in the background that we're logging and it should be, it seems theoretically simple to data mine and extract this information for turnaround time, concordance rates, procedure volume. Yep. So I think that's where platforms are, are going to start essentially uh, um, allowing us to collect those data. And even the small number of AI vendors that do provide the mechanism for providing that feedback, in general, you don't have a mechanism to compare one versus the other. They're not sharing that information. So I agree with you completely. Platforms and mechanisms to be able to collect those data are something that we absolutely should have now. There's no reason, although creating feedback on that data is not easy. What additional work does the radiologist have? And then what is that feedback? Is that feedback just an agreement or disagreement? Is that feedback a change in segmentation? Is that something where the radiologist says, well, I kind of don't agree, but I'm not really sure. And so creating a vocabulary for providing that feedback, common data elements, is something that hasn't been devised yet. So. Really, it's, it sounds simple and it technically should be, but figuring out the actual mechan mechanism to do that, I think is a little tricky. So maybe taking a slightly different <laughs> twist on this for um, our esteemed editors in chief of Radiology AI and Radiology, uh, Chuck and Linda, do you think <laughs> that there's a role for the scientific community to build evidence around these types of things, maybe moving beyond just simply proving a proof of concept of segmentation of the adrenal glands, but then saying, how does this actually work in clinical <laughs> practice? I'm curious if what well, your thoughts are on that as the uh, leaders of these journals. I'll, I'll start because I have the mic. I would say yes. Pardon me. <coughs> I will in a moment. Okay. Here. Pardon me. Okay. 
<laughs> so I think, you know, journals definitely need to sort of to lead the way to really, you know, get us ready for clin clinical implementation. I think one of the things that Ellie had mentioned was you need to have this concept of clinical realism, you know, that the algorithms are FDA approved are tested on very narrow, retrospective, enriched database. And, you know, those don't work when it's applied to your patient. You know, we talked about the positive A and by. So I think a lot of work needs to be done. And I'll tell you, it is the journal's responsibility to find um, publications that are have a high likelihood of being reproducible. So, you know, for us now, you know, we, for all papers, we um, require that authors give their code in a public accessible, uh, in a public accessible repository. I'd say this year in 2020, we did not accept any um, AI paper that did not have at least one external data set. So we are pushing up the bar in making it sure that this isn't vaporware that we're publishing on. What she said. Um, no, it's it's absolutely critical that as we go forward, we we are recording uh, and and incorporating that information because um, although many of these systems work very well in the in the little petri dish in which they've been developed, once they get out and we're beginning to use them in actual clinical practice, it's it's critical that we have a full understanding and that we begin to capture that information. Uh, as these systems are are deployed into into real world, real, pardon me, real world practices. I think another thing is that again, we we as radiologists tend to focus on the diagnosis, but I think there's a lot of importance to the process and collecting all the information there. And I'm I'm going to quote my good friend Raym Geis over there. We were just having a discussion. There's a lot of value in all the other information about how a study was collected. Like he, he was talking about an example of say a pulmonary embolism detector. And you look back at the data and it turns out one CT scanner is giving all the false negatives or one radiologist or one technologist or one injector, right? Because it's too late, too early, something like that. There's a lot more than just you got it right or you got it wrong. There's a lot of potential for business improvement. So again, I, I, I'm concerned that sometimes we we think about just the radiologist, not radiology. And I think we need to, to be a little bit more broad-minded about all the potential value that's in, in the data that we could collect. And going and going forward with it too, being able to to link to outcomes data so that the question isn't is the AI better than a human, but is does using the AI actually improve patient outcomes? And that's that's really where we want to, to go. Real quick here, it's gonna pause for a moment because we did promise you an opportunity to ask us questions. So please raise your, raise your hand or give us a sign or, or just shout out. Don't shout out, I'll bring a mic to you. But raise your hand if you have a question and we'll come over to you so we can continue this conversation. Looks like we've got uh, Brianna Malik in the back. Ready? Thank you. Hi, yeah. I had a question on, I guess I wanted to ask for your thoughts on the use of um, language models for medical imaging. I've been looking at a lot of posters and a couple of talks about that, so I wanted to know your thoughts on that. You're, the best. You're pointing at me. I'm well, pointing maybe at you. first question, what is a language model for those of us in the crowd who aren't as smart as uh, Ms. Malik? I guess uh, my understanding is the use of natural language processing mainly for the, um, I guess, analysis and the structure of radiology reports, so making them more structured and easier to just understand the data. So there, there's a whole range of tools that fall under this, the, the umbrella of NLP, natural language processing, right? Everything from uh, identifying particular things, being able to recognize something and its synonyms to some of the most sophisticated models that are out there now, which are uh, transformers, so-called, the, these uh, attention-based models. And they're, they've shown a lot of power and there are a lot of really fascinating applications. Everything from summarizing a report to being able to take, for example, the findings and auto-generate the impression text. Uh, being able to read the report and basically do question answering to, to say, 
does it, it does this patient have an enlarged kidney to, you know from from reading the text of the report so in other words trying to generate higher level understanding of of radiology reports um, as well using the tools to de-identify reports because for a lot of us as as we uh, we build systems um, we use the radiology report as a source of ground truth of as training data so that if the system says no pneumothorax, well, what you don't, you know, the radiologist, pardon me, if the radiologist in the report says no pneumothorax, what you don't want is you don't want a system that just does named entity recognition that says, oh, pneumothorax, I see the word, therefore it must be present. And there was a wonderful study that was published a couple years ago that found that radiologists have 42 ways of saying that there is no pneumothorax. No pneumothorax is present. I do not see a pneumoth, you know, it, and, and on and on. So being able to understand that and understand the construction of sentences is phenomenally important. Actually, it even turns out when you say there, there are no, uh, there's no evidence of gallstones, wall thickening, or pericholocystic fluid. By the time, in with most, a lot of NLP systems, by the time they get to pericholocystic fluid, they, they've forgotten about the word no, and they don't know how to, they don't recognize that. So, but the, these attention-based models, BERT, based uh, transformers you may have heard are are showing remarkable power and the thing that's actually cool about it is these were built uh, to do with la deal with language models they're now being used as vision transformers they're being actually applied to image information and they're showing a lot of power there as well and it, it's a great question because we've been concentrating on pixel data and so looking at the report itself one of the challenges is Radiology is not its own separate island, but we essentially are in an ecosystem. We may be the leaders in AI, but medicine, surgery, all of the different specialties are going to be utilizing algorithms, and they're going to need to discover information from our reports. And so figuring out how to take radiology reports and put them into a format that is machine intelligible. You know, what's the level, level of confidence? What exactly are you saying? What aren't you saying? And so the success of systems like BIRADS and LUNGRADS and PIRADS, et cetera, have been, they've been pithy and they've essentially forced radiologists to create a level of structure, but they only exist for a small subset. And so the idea of using some of these language models to make the content of a radiology report machine intelligible and potentially human intelligible, you know, are, are, is I think really exciting. And so to some extent, we're structuring our reports more and more, but to some extent, these natural language models are helping to um, translate our reports into structured formats that can be discovered. I, I would say, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, so a, another angle on this too is that we assume that what is in the report is understandable. And I think there's an element of that that's lacking. And in particular, we, we so we've been working on this whole problem of understanding certainty. And you know, if there are 42 ways to say pneumothorax, there's probably 42,000 ways to say pneumothorax from zero to 100% probability, right? And it's for a lot of things, it's, you know, it's diagnostic with, it's compatible with, it's consistent with. There's so many different words and the different threshold, you know, for Chuck, when he says that, it's 80%. When Erickson says it, it's, you know, 32%. And so even if we can deal with the language part of it, understanding what that particular person meant when he said that word is another problem that that uh, we still have a lot of distance to go. Yeah. I was just going to say two comments. One is that, yes, the key is to have standardization of the language. That's why these pirates, lyrats are so important because they say it is transmittable using common data elements is important. But I'll tell you, we have already started using NLP, and I think that actually has a lot more potential right now than this pixel-based AI system. So we extract reports. When, you know, when it says the words incidental and we are being able to actually um, have a higher follow up in capturing patients where we see incidental finds report based upon then combing some of the EHR system, we can identify which patients are less likely to come back for follow up studies. Again, we're doing the NLP and then being able to actually protocol the exams you know, pretty markedly well. So now there's a template and the fellow just double checks it, you know, so I think there are, are very big gains that you can use with that already that many of us are employing. If you ask me what's the biggest challenge in radiology today, it's communication. We have so many cases where we make a recommendation and it doesn't get followed. 
or we make an incidental finding that's important and there's not a follow-up on that and using natural language to extract that information and to be able to track some of those recommendations, some of those incidental findings, I think is really going to be key moving forward. And I agree that may be as or more important than the pixel data and analytics. I just want to add that I think another huge area is that you may have your model, but to kind of look at the outcomes data, you really do have to use text-based analysis of all of the auxiliary information out in the electronic medical records. So there's many of us trying to mine EPIC and these other um, electronic medical record systems, and it's incredibly difficult because the format that that comes to you in is very disorganized with, with many, many lines of code. So I think that I think that's another place to use some of these systems. All right, we've probably got time for one more question. Um, all right, I think we got a winner. I'm just wondering the panel's opinion about radiomics and extracting more information out of the images and using AI to analyze that um, in, to improve diagnostic performance, uh, prediction, uh, treatment response, those sorts of things. Um, so, Elliot, what do you want me to say? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I may be a little bit of an outlier. I personally am not super enthusiastic about radiomics being better than machine learning. I think if you have enough examples, this machine learning algorithm probably will find whatever radiomics would find and potentially is better because the traditional way of doing radiomics is that you calculate your textures or whatever, which may not be quite right. Whereas machine learning, at least theoretically, has the potential to find the best I, I, I think of it particularly if you think about a convolutional neural network that you've got the key that fits the lock, right? And you're kind of saying, well, I've got these 32 keys and gosh darn, one of them is going to turn that lock, right? So that's why I'm not super excited about radiomics. People will then respond, but radiomics is understandable. And I say, really? So when you have, you know, grade level co-occurrence co matrix number 1356, how does that relate to the underlying molecules? So I'm not, I'm not convinced that that's that much more understandable. It may be more robust, okay, maybe. But I, again, I think there are comebacks to that. So, so that's my perhaps a little bit outlier opinion, and I'm happy to debate my friend Elliot or anybody else on that. Yeah, I could say so. Just a caution regarding a hot debate. We have about two minutes, so keep that in mind. But I, the only thing I was going to add is that you know, the problem with radiomics is the same problem we have with deep learning. It works. Um, and, you know, often we don't know exactly how or why. We don't know to the level that it does. Um, I'm, dis despite the fact that uh, I seem to have something to do with AI, I I'm, I'm remain very much a skeptic of, of deep learning. I, I think it's remarkably powerful and it, it does things. It, it seems to find adrenal glands. But I don't trust it. Not as well as far as I. But and we'll apparently, on that. yeah, I, 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 exactly right. And um, Elliot washes my car, by the way, every week, so um, I can. T anyway, um, no. The, but I think one of the challenges is, you know, we 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 are starting. We see papers, and it, and it suggests that radiomics is effective. Again, it's the sort of magic that you run some calculations over the data. The the tool sees some things in the image, you know, more than the speculation and, and sphericity and sort of the usual things that we're used to looking at. And clusters, you know, it does a cluster analysis, basically a principal component analysis, you know, kind of more basic statistical techniques to figure out what, you know, of all of those dimensions that it's measuring, which are effective and, and connect to the outcomes. And so for a lot of them, it, it actually shows reasonable predictive power. But I think I think there's some some validity to the notion too that as we grow the number of spaces, I think there are a lot of fascinating areas for. And I'm sorry to pull it a little, bit, but just the idea of reducing training burden, working off of smaller data sets and being able to use that, and then doing, a, you know, to have t train it on ten cases, test it on ten thousand. Um, it would be kind of a direction I'd like to see us going with with a lot of these. But it's a great yours is a great question. Well, our, we're running out of loops on our fireside chat here on the fire. So it's getting a little hot here. Yeah, too. A little bit. So we're going to take the opportunity to say 
Thank you. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to each of you for being here. Hopefully we, you've heard something to inspire you or to answer some burning question uh, that brought you to our session. Thank you. That's something that brought you to our session here. Uh, and shout out to our podcast. Catch, despite what we told you, this is all recorded. So catch us on Spotify, on wherever you get your podcast, and, and we can relive this experience. And a special shout out to our editor-in-chief, Chuck Kahn, for making all of this possible, as well as our RSNA podcast staff. My name is Paul Yi. I'm the co-host of the Radiology AI podcast, and it's been a pleasure. My name is Ali Tijani. I'm also a co-host, and thank you again, and have the great RSNA. Thank you. All right. We hope that you've enjoyed this episode of the Radiology Artificial Intelligence podcast. Shout out to Yuri Aishamchison for our podcast music and to the RSNA podcast staff. Email us at podcasts at rsna.org anytime with questions, feedback, or suggestions.